So today we continue our series that entitled, But You Say. Last week we talked a little bit about the backdrop of uh, Malachi, how the people of God were overtaken by Babylon, and then King Cyrus came, granted them the opportunity to be able to go back to Jerusalem and to uh, rebuild the temple. Uh, in the process, Malachi had some strong words uh, to share with uh, the people of God. And in those strong words, there was a lot of love because he recognized that in the only way that God could really uh, fulfill all that he wanted for his children, the children of God needed to be prepared to receive all of that. So in your bulletin, there's an outline if you'd like to follow along. And uh, as we think about just a sense of complacency that we can fall into, the malaise that we can fall into uh, because of everything that goes on into our lives, uh, Malachi had an assignment. And so I wrote there in the introduction, no prophet or preacher who loves his people really enjoys pointing out their sin or warning them of doom to come. So Malachi must have found his assignment, which was so packed with judgment of the priests and of the people, a hard one. All the threats, warnings, challenges, encouragement, and promises were for the spiritual upbuilding of those returning from exile and for their children. God and Malachi wanted a righteous nation. They wanted a pure and devoted priesthood. They wanted happy homes, God-fearing children, and a people characterized by truth, integrity, generosity, gratitude, fidelity, love, and hope. And I think that's what we are all looking for. We want a righteous nation. We want to be able to live in a place where we feel comfortable as a nation. We want to have a sense where when we, when we go to church, we want to hear the word of God. We want a, a devoted priesthood. We want happy homes at the end of the day. We want happy children. We want people that when we deal with them, there's no sense of wondering, are they telling me the truth or not? I, I, are they trying to pull something over me? We all want that. And the only way we can have that is when God is in the middle of it. And yet we are living in a society where everything's going wrong because we've taken God out. And then they try to fix it without bringing God in. It's never going to happen. So therefore, we need to be very careful as we think about this passage. And as I said last week, really the admonishment and the indictment was on the priesthood, or as we would call the preachers of today, that we had to be mindful of what God is saying. And today, the indictments are going to be, I'll remind ourselves of the priesthood and also the people. So at the end of the day, these indictments are not really pointing the fingers as much as a loving, real sense of saying, I want you, I want so badly for you to experience all of the goodness of God. But you can't until you return to God. So let's look at the indictments of God towards his people. And I'll recap a little bit from uh, last week where we, we think about the first part of uh, chapter 1, verse 2. This is where the people, again, questioned the love of God. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. And I talked to you a little bit from Genesis where Isaac and Rebekah had children, and they were twins in Rebekah's womb. And God said distinctly that even though he was going to have Esau and Jacob, Esau is the first one that came out. And usually the firstborn gets everything. And yet God said, Esau, I'm going to put aside, 
The younger brother is going to be over the older brother. The older brother will serve the younger brother. And what God was trying to say is this. I have made a decision. I have chosen you, Jacob. I have chosen you, my people. As our theme verse says, you have not chosen me, but what? I have chosen you. And God was reminding them, how are you questioning my love when I chose you? You had no choice in this here. I chose you and I want to bless you. But yet, and I gave you a little bit of background from the first uh, deliverance from Egypt and the second one here, uh, when, they, when God brought his people out of Egypt, uh, there was a lot of miracles that follows. And the second thing here, as they're coming from Babylon, there's no real great miracles happening. So I think the priesthood got discouraged and the people got discouraged and they wondered, you know, why aren't the same things happening like the Red Sea being opened up or manna fall, falling from heaven or us having, you know, water from a rock? Why don't we have those things? Does God not love us as much anymore? And I think whenever we get to that place, and this is really important for us to understand, whenever we get to the place of questioning whether God loves us or not, something is wrong on the inside. We must be hurting at some level for us to begin to question that. I, I, I thought about it for a second. How would we feel as parents if our children came to us and said, I don't think you love me? After all that we do for them, if they came back and said, I don't think you love me, it will break our hearts. And God's heart was broken that the people would question if he loved them. After all that he's done for them. The second indictment is the priest despised the name of God. In chapter 1, verse 6, it says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is, not, is to be despised. In verse 8, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? And again, here we, we have something going on that's very fundamental to the people of God is that the sacrifice had to be a pure sacrifice. God always asked for a pure lamb or ram, not, not one that had broken legs, not one that had blemishes, not one that had any defects. Always, that's fundamental. And how is it that at this point here, they're bringing blind animals, lame animals, sick animals, you know what, what's going on here? What's going on here is the fact that they've lost respect for God, and they're saying, I'll bring whatever is left over. At first, there was a sense, we'll bring the best to God. But then something happened in their heart. They got discouraged somehow, and they got to the point of saying, you know what, whatever is left over, it's going to be good enough for God. God will understand. And oftentimes, that's what we have as an attitude. God will understand. God understands my circumstances. God wants your best all the time because God is always going to give you and me his best. Verse 12 of chapter 1 says, But you are profaning it in that you say, The table of the Lord is defiled, as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. So what's going on here is this. They're not saying Anything outwardly, it's only their action that's speaking. So God is, is taking their action and is putting words behind it. Because sometimes we don't have the courage to say something against God. Right? But we will have this 
this way of um, sort of being passive aggressive. We're not going to say anything outwards, but you're going to see our actions. And our actions is going to reflect everything that's going on inside the heart. They knew what was going on. They didn't want to say it. Well, actually, actually, I'm not even sure they knew what was going on. Maybe I'll re- re- rephrase that. I think they had lo- lost so much understanding of their relationship with God that these things were happening and it was not bothering them one bit. See, when you are close to God, whenever you do something wrong, there's something that pierces you. You know it. So something has happened here where they've become so dull to everything that's wrong. And again, God is trying to bring them out of that. Malachi has a a big job to do here to help them understand that. The third indictment was begrudging worship. Verse 13 of chapter 1 says, You also say, my, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick. So you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? It's almost like I said it last week, right? There's a sense of sometimes we feel like, oh, my goodness, I have to go to church today. The only day I have to rest, and I have to go to church, because if I don't go, it's not going to look good on me, right? Especially I'm a deacon. I'm a trustee. I'm a Sunday school teacher, right? There's people that know that I go to church, and if I don't show up, they'll ask me, why didn't you show up? So I have to go. It's almost like we're forcing ourselves to come to church. And and as, as Rose mentioned, if we really understood, you know, how good God is, our worship will be so fervent, so much excitement because we recognize who God is. And when we recognize who God is, God does incredible things. And so the reminders are a good thing. The reminders are a good thing. And, as, and, and the more I look into the book of Malachi, uh, the more I understand that he really has a heart for the people because he wants to see the people blessed again. So the fourth indictment is this, disregard for the sacredness of family. In chapter 2, verse 10 and following says, Do we not all have one Father? Has not, has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously against each other, uh, each against his brother, so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. And as, as Malachi is trying to remind them, he's saying, you have done something here that's really, really bad. And this is not talking about interracial marriage, per se. But there's a sense of, if you're going to marry You have to marry within your own value system. If you don't have the same value system, the Apostle Paul says, don't be unequally yoked. If you don't have the same value system, you're going to have to compromise at some point. So if you marry someone from a different religion, so to speak, you're going to eventually have to give in to their God in order to keep peace in the house. And God says, no, I am God. There'll be no other. You will worship me and me alone. I am a jealous God. And so Malachi is pointing to them that what you have done here is wrong because now you are selling your God short. You are selling yourself short because you're not fully worshiping God. And eventually when you don't have the same value system, it turns into something else. Verse 12 says, as for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off uh, from the, t- uh, the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accept it with favor from your hand. 
There's a sense, again, we do something, there's, there's a cause right here, we do something here that is not right, and then we go to God, and we are pleading with God, and God doesn't seem to answer. Our response is, well, God doesn't love me. No, 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 you need to go back one more step here. Why isn't God answering? Because right now, right here where I am, I'm doing something that's not right. And we, I need to fix that first because you can, you can cry, a, you know, cry a river if you want at the altar of God. God is asking you, how are you living your life in relationship with me? If that's not there, nothing's going to work. And then as he goes on with this next particular uh, portion of Scripture in chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Yet you say, for what reason? Why is God not answering us? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking godly offsprings? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. Verse 16, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts, so take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So we have, again, when you go outside of your values, your value system, eventually what's going to happen is you're not going to get along. And divorce is going to come into the picture. And God says he hates divorce, not because divorce is the worst thing in the world, because I'm going to read a couple of things here. God hates a lot of stuff. But there's something about our relationship, the sacredness of the family. See, when we get to the place where, again, it says, verse 14, yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. By, by divorcing your wife, the person that you have been with, you are causing her wrong. And on top of that, that affects everything about your whole family. See, divorce, if it was just only between two people, that'd be one thing. But divorce is between two people, two families, and sometimes children. And one survey was taken some time back with the elementary school children. And they said, what is it, your top ten fears? And you know what number one was? That our parents would divorce. There's something about security in the heart of a child that mom and dad get along. Now again, God hates divorce, but that's not the greatest sin because God hates a lot of other things as well. See, the Bible says the only two grounds for divorce is if there's infidelity on one hand, and you see that in Matthew chapter 19, or in, as Paul was trying to explain it in 1 Corinthians 7, it says if two unbelievers get married and then one becomes a believer, if the other one does not want to go along, then they can divorce and that's okay. That's the only two reasons. We can create a whole bunch of other scenarios, but that's the only two reasons that God gives us because it is very sacred. But I want to go back to the fact that I just don't want to highlight divorce and, and make it the worst sin in the world because in Zechariah 8.17 it said, Also let none of you devise evil in your heart against another and do not love perjury. God hates lies. Of all kinds. For all these are what I hate, declares the Lord. Malachi 3.5 says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerer, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, who oppress the widow and the orphan, of those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me. God hates all of that. In other words, God hates sin.
We are entering into the Advent season. And this is really important because we are expecting the Christ, the Messiah. And in Matthew says that he will come to save his people from their sin. Sin is not a new word. Right? We have sinned against God. And the only way we can fix that is for us to ask God to forgive us. And only Christ could be that sacrifice, that pure sacrifice that would die on a cross for our sins. We are entering that season. And I remember some time back preaching a sermon. And in that sermon, I said to, to the people, I said, some of you are worshiping the very holiday that might one day might condemn you. Because as you sit here celebrating Christmas and you turn on God, then you have no excuse. And that was so offensive to at least one person that they picked up their bag, left the church. Because I said, we might be celebrating the very thing that will condemn us. If you are here ready to celebrate Advent and Christmas, the coming of Jesus, and yet you want to continue to be in your sin, you have no excuse. Sin is not a new word, and Malachi is trying to help them understand that. We've got to change our ways. The fifth indictment is blasphemy. Chapter 2, verse 17 says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good, in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? Imagine that the people are saying to God, basically, you're not fair. Those that are doing well, you are punishing, and those that are doing evil, you are prospering. That's blasphemy. And I will cover up in the se- in co- co- uh, cover more of this in a second here to make sure we understand nobody gets away with anything at the end. We might think that people are getting away with stuff, but nobody gets away with anything at the end because God is a righteous God. He sees everything, knows everything, and nobody can fool him. So we need to trust him, even though we are seeing. And, you know, that's one of those things where I, I shared this morning. I, I'm not concerned so much with the way the world is going, right? Because some of us are thinking this is like the worst time ever. Well, there's been other times like this in the past. God always has a way of bringing us back in the right path. There's always going to be a remnant. There's always going to be people that God's going to use to redirect everything. So we, we, need to, we need to make sure we understand that when we see these things happening, don't be afraid, don't be alarmed. Just take care of your relationship with God. See, because when I take care of my relationship with God, you take care of your relationship with God, as a whole, we begin to impact a whole lot of people. But if we decide, well, God is not a God of justice, then all of a sudden we're giving ourselves permission to go and do whatever we want. And this is where the church, unfortunately, has gone to. Everybody has decided God is not fair enough, so I'm going to take care of my business. I'm going to do things my own way. I want to encourage you, please trust God. He knows what's going on. He knows what he's he's doing. Sixth indictment, lack of repentance. Chapter 3, verse 7 says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? I want you to see verse 7 again. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Sin is an old thing. Every generation has gone through it. From the days of their fathers, they had turned aside from God's statutes. And God says, return to me, and what? 
I will return to you. But they say, how shall we return? In other words, it's saying, almost, are you going to take us back? You've been so unfair, which is part of the argument, will you take us back? And God is really offended at the fact that we might say, or even ask the question, will he take us back? No, God says if you come to him, he will in no way despise you or cast you aside. But how shall we return? The way we return is just recognize what we have done, acknowledge it, repent, confess, and move forward. Not make excuses, because for the most part, we go through things, we do stuff, and then we begin to make excuses. This is why I'm doing this. Seventh indictment, robbery. But you say, how have we robbed you? Verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. And then it says, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. See, the people as a, as a nation began to, again, when you are, your relationship with God is not right, when your perception of God is not right, when you are not bringing the right sacrifice because you don't think God is fair, then all of a sudden what you have that you're supposed to give, in your bulletin I made sure to have this definition for you, stealing is not only taking what is not yours, but also keeping back for yourself what belongs to someone else. So when we talk about tithes and offering, it doesn't belong to you. It's been in your possession. It doesn't belong to you, and sometimes we are holding it back because we're thinking, hey, you know what? I worked hard for this. And God is saying, test me in this. Trust me. Bring everything to the storehouse. And then there's something, verse 11 says, then I will rebuke the devourer for you. Every time somebody comes into my office with financial issues, one of the first questions I ask them is, do you tithe? Because if you don't tithe, that is the beginning of your financial problems. See, when we try to keep everything that God gives us and we refuse to give back because we don't know if he's going to give us any more, it's interesting how, you know, verse 11, then I will rebuke the devourer. Maybe you've never experienced it. I'm just going to put it out there. You can process it. You know what you were supposed to give. You didn't give it. And then your car breaks down. And all the stuff that uh, you didn't give goes into the car and more. Your house leaks. Your refrigerator breaks down. Your water heater breaks down. All of a sudden, you're like, all this money that I had saved because I thought, you know, for a rainy day, I guess the rainy day has come. And God's saying, no, I can, I can rebuke the devourer. All these things here. God can take care of these things if we are faithful. I sat down with, with a young lady, and uh, she told me one of the most wonderful story, stories. Uh, she said to me, my mom was such a devout Christian that whatever she had for God will always go to God. And she says, here I am, one of, I don't know how many siblings, the only one really pursuing college in another continent. And she says, I'm ready to start my next semester. And I come to my mother and say, I need the money to pay for the semester. And mom says to me, I vowed to God to give some of this money 
to fix the roof in the church. So therefore, I don't have the money for your tuition. And the girl got all upset until she realized that her mom was trying to be faithful. And before you know it, she says, there was money to pay for my tuition. These are examples that come all the time. Because the more you have a desire to give, the more you open up for God to give you back. And so this is a whole nation that decided we're not going to you know, pay our tithes and offerings because we don't trust God anymore. So when you withhold from God, will a man rob God? God said yes in your tithes and offering. Last indictment, arrogance. Chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. It says, your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his charge? And that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts. So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of uh, wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. It is vain to serve the Lord. And what, verse 14, and what profit is it that we have kept his charge? And what, and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts. This is a people that have given up in trusting God. And as I was processing it, the first indictment and the last indictment are pretty much the same. The first indictment is they said that God does not love them. The last indictment here is they're saying it is vain to serve the Lord. What, it, what does it profit that we have kept his charge? Because after all that we're doing, the wicked still prospering, maybe that's the way we should go. And God says, no, that's not the way we should go. There's a different way to go. We need to trust God in his fullness. So the people of Israel, instead, as all these indictments have come, Instead of pleading guilty, they did like most of everybody else, right? They said, not guilty. I don't understand. What do you mean? How do you mean? How, how, how did we do this? In all the indictments, the people of God, from the priest to the laity, could not understand why God was upset. And to this day, some people, I just don't understand why God would be upset at sin. We still take sin very lightly. We don't think it, it affects God at all. We think we can continue in sin, and just when everything breaks down, we can come to God and say, God, help me. And if God doesn't move, say, well, I, I didn't think you would anyway, because God is not fair. How dull does our spirit have to get that we would not trust that God is a creator of all things? He's sovereign. He knows everything. He knows everything that's going on in your life. He's got a plan for everything that's going on in your life and how he's going to turn that around. Your responsibility, my responsibility, is to be faithful. They pleaded not guilty. My question to us here today is how do we plead? I'm going to give you a couple examples. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when Stephen was preaching to the people, verse 50, 54 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. When they heard Stephen preach, something touched a nerve. They didn't believe Stephen, but something touched a nerve. And they decided they're going to kill him. The second example that I have for you is in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, where David has committed adultery with Bathsheba and uh, has committed murder of her husband. 
And Nathan the prophet is trying to come and, and share with the king. He's going through a parable process. And then David says, you know, whoever did this is supposed to die. They should die. And then verse 7, then Nathan said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who will deliver you from the, the hand of Saul. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has, uh, also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. You know, the wonderful thing about David is that he didn't try to find an excuse. When he was confronted with his sin, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. How do we plead today? In thinking about our own relationship with God and all the things that goes on in our lives, do we try, are we still trying to find excuses? Are we going to get to the place of saying, you know what? I have sinned. And the only way that this can be taken care of is for me to say, God, forgive me. It is to repent of my sin and ask God to forgive me. Understand again that Jesus is coming as we celebrate Advent and Christmas. Jesus is coming for one purpose, to forgive us our sin. God did not make it difficult. As I, as I wrap it up, and that means absolutely nothing. God promised to come in, in chapter 3, the verse that we read. Behold, I'm coming. I'm going to send my messenger. And that's in, in, in Matthew, you read that. That's talking about John the Baptist. And I will clear, and he will clear the way for me. And that's Jesus. And the Lord whom you seek. The people of God has all, have always been seeking this Messiah. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like the fullest soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in, in the days of old as, and as in former years. If God has sent his son to die for our sins, to purify us, that's because sin is not a good thing. Sin gets in the way of everything that is good. And the Bible tells us there's none righteous not even one. So don't be afraid of, the, of the, 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 the word. Don't be afraid of the word sin. Understand that that's who we are, sinners. And that the Messiah came to take away our sins. And he did not make it difficult for us. So it's a free gift. It's a free gift. You don't have to work for it. Jesus has paid it for us. So why not just receive that? Why not stop making the excuses that we're making and just recognize, you know what? Yes, I have sinned. Now, you may be a, a, a Christian and still understand that you sin every day. And you need to be able to come before God and sort of, sort of allow him to be that, uh, that uh, refiner's fire that just purifies you every day. Because the purer we are, the purer things come out of us. And as it comes out of us, it affects other people around us. 
So let God do what he came to do in your hearts, in my hearts, so that as the people of God, we can have an impact in our families, in our communities, in our churches. Let's allow God to just cleanse us. Last point I, I have here for you. Nothing escapes God. He's aware of everything. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, For behold, the day is coming, like, uh, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Two things here. God is seeing everything that's happening. God has sent his son. First advent. We are not waiting for the second advent. And there's some people still not paying attention to their sin, not confessing their sins. And when God comes with judgment, then it'll be too late. So therefore, now is the time for us to say, well, you know what? I, I understand that Jesus came. I understand why he came. He came to die for my sins. So therefore, I'm going to ask him to forgive me my sins. Because when he comes again, then he will destroy everything. Verse 2, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves in the stall. You will tread down the wicked, and there will be ashes under the sole of your feet on the day which I'm preparing, says the Lord of hosts. God is aware of what's going on. God is aware of the one that's against you, starting with the our primary... Uh, primary enemy, which is the devil. He's also aware of the people around you that are trying to take advantage of you and do all kinds of things to you. God is aware of all of that. And no one will escape him because no one can. In the conclusion, I wrote there for us, the default plea in the human court of law, by and large, is always not guilty. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter that they have the video. It doesn't matter that they have the fingerprints. It doesn't matter that you have everything there, all the evidence against you. You go to court of law, you plead not guilty, hoping that a very clever defense attorney is going to find some loopholes to at least cut your sentence. When it comes to God, let's understand there are no loopholes. So let's plead guilty. As Peter said in Acts chapter 2, when he preached after Pentecost, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter, as he was preaching, 